as divers, we get to see sites like this when we visit a shipwreck. We can see the everyday items that our ancestors used, uh, the coffee pots, the stove that warmed that coffee that morning, the dishes that they had their last meal from, even the tools they used and the clothing they wore. Diving on a shipwreck, it's like going back in time. Now, in order, in order to do this, we need to be able to breathe underwater. And man's been trying to do that for hundreds of years using various contraptions. Fortunately, in 1943, another Frenchman, this one you've probably heard of by the name of Jacques Cousteau helped invent something called the demand regulator. It was a device which significantly increased bottom times. It opened the floodgates for what would become a new sport and ultimately a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. Today, with advancements in equipment such as rebreathers, divers can safely go deeper and they can stay longer than ever before. Uh, this is my dive buddy, Steve Weimer. He's in a lot of the photos we're gonna look at this afternoon and he's wearing a rebreather. That is a very high tech piece of equipment. Now one piece of equipment that I rarely leave behind is my camera because photographing shipwrecks is my passion. And that's kind of the main reason that I dive. I've been doing this for better part of 20 years, traveling around North America, not just in the Great Lakes, but mostly in the Great Lakes, but photographing shipwrecks in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, um, off of Mexico, off of Venezuela, even the Eastern seaboard. Now that we know why so many ships go to the bottom of the Great Lakes, we're gonna take a look at some photos that really exemplify the great diversity of those different types of ships, while at the same time showcasing their incredible haunting beauty. We're gonna start off in Georgian Bay, which is really a part of Lake Huron. And we're gonna visit the steamer Manasu. Now, after being laid up for the winter, her season was done. She was safely tucked away. The passenger steamer Manasu was pressed into service for one last run of the year. It was gonna bring a hundred or give or take head of cattle back to the mainland from Manitoulin Island. Now, less than 12 hours into the trip home, the weather started kicking up and the ship with 21 souls aboard began to list. Within minutes, she rolled over onto her side and then she slid below the wave stern first. And as she hit bottom over 200 feet below, her captain, some of the crew, and the owner of the cattle were floating in a life raft, cold and wet, and they were there for two and a half days. The westerly winds blew them almost all the way over to the eastern shore before the wind changed and blew them right back almost to where the whole ordeal began. <laughs> That's why it took two and a half days for them to get rescued. It's suspected that the, uh, the herd of cattle is what actually caused the accident when they broke loose from their pens. All the shifting weight probably caused the vessel to list badly in that storm. Now, before we look at the underwater pictures of it, let's take a look at this black and white photo. I'm kind of circling the smokestack right now with my cursor. We're gonna take a look at that. We're also going to notice these lifeboats. There was four of them on board the vessel when it uh, sank. One got launched and the other three actually went to the bottom of the lake with it. Also, these square openings on the side of the hull here, these are openings that were used for loading cargo onto the cargo deck. They could be closed up in inclement weather and typically were closed up with boards once they were underway. And then the other thing is the pilot house. This is this little room up here on the front with the windows and this, this staircase, this uh, stairs coming down from the pilot house deck to the, to the main weather deck. Uh, these are all some really cool features of this vessel, which we are gonna look at right now. So this is over 200 feet. This is about 205 feet to the bottom. It's very deep and it's in incredible condition. Um, this is that staircase that we were just looking at. Very rare for this kind of stuff to still be attached to the vessel. Usually when these ships sank, built up air pressure within the vessel would cause any wooden structures such as cabins and pilot houses to just blow off explosively almost like, like somebody put a stick of dynamite in there and just blow off due to the built up air pressure as the vessel sank. So to see a, um, all these wood cabins and structures still in place, it, it's rare and it's just a real treat. But now imagine yourself, you just walked up to the top of those stairs and you're standing in front of this window. And you're looking inside the pilot house. This is what you would see. That is the helm or the ship's wheel. 
and it's in just immaculate condition, not a spoke out of place or broken. Even the paint, the red, and I'm not sure if it's a dark blue or a black, but that paint is still on there. Uh, and in front of the wheel, right at the base of the window, is actually a gimbaled compass, which means it can rock and roll as the ship pitches in the water. The compass always remains level. Um, now, I want you to picture yourself the last final moments. Uh, bad storm. You know the ship's going to sink. You're wondering if you're going to even survive the ordeal. You're the helmsman. You're standing at the wheel. The captain has not given you the release to, to leave your station yet. You're wondering, well, what time is it? You look to your left, and there on the wall is that clock still sitting there after 90 years. Now, the hands have rusted away, but we can see the rust stains on that white clock face there. Um, these are just absolute incredible details that make that human connection to shipwreck so real for a diver. We talked about the smokestack. Well, when it fell over, it crushed one of the lifeboats. And here's one of the lifeboats underneath that smokestack in the background of this photo. This is um, one of the other lifeboats here. And the reason I took this photo is because of the hand labeling of some dimensions, L for length, B for beam, D for depth. I'm not sure what the other ones would be, but the cool part is, is that over 90 years ago, somebody wrote that by hand on that lifeboat, thinking that these were important figures. And they, they exist there today, nearly a century later. Just fantastic. The third lifeboat that went down with the vessel is actually on the lake bottom. And we're not going to see a picture of it because it's a little lackluster. But at any rate, it, uh, it went on, uh, down to the bottom with the, with the ship. And it's sort of on the lake bottom at the stern. And we talked about those cargo loading hatches on the side of the vessel. This is one of them with the, the, the top half uh, has fallen away. The bottom half is still in place. And inside here, my buddy Steve is photographing a 1927 Chevrolet two-door coupe. This car was uh, what belonged to the owner of the cattle. And he was shipping this along with his cattle. It was only one year old when it went down with the vessel. And as you can see, it's still in pretty good condition for being in a violent shipwreck and sinking 200 feet. Um, even the bow tie emblem, the Chevy bow tie emblem on the grill is still just in beautiful, immaculate condition. Not like the rest of the car, but um, I think relatively speaking, it's doing all right. So that was the Manasu. We're going to stay in Lake Huron and we're going to slide up to the tip of the Bruce Peninsula. This is Ontario, Canada right here. And at the tip of the Bruce Peninsula is uh, Tobomori, Ontario, which is just a, a hotbed for shipwreck diving because of the fact that it's sort of a choke point, all the vessels going back and forth between Huron and, and, and um, Georgian Bay need to sort of cross through there. And so um, that is a place where divers like to go and it's just great uh, clear water and everything else. And we're going to take a look at the Bark Arabia, which was a 31 year old two masted sailing ship. So a wooden sailing vessel. She was bringing corn from Chicago, Illinois to Midland, Ontario when she got caught in a fierce storm near Tobamori. The crew manned those pumps for 18 hours before they finally gave up on their ship. They couldn't keep the water out and they said, we're getting out of here. They launched their yaw boat. They rowed to the safety of nearby Echo Island, which is now also oddly enough called Horse Island because it references the several horses which were aboard the Arabia when it sank. And they swam to Echo Island after the sinking where they actually lived out the rest of their lives. So now it's also known as Horse Island. In 1985, it was the 100th anniversary of this shipwreck going down. So it's been on the bottom a long time. And they placed a stone memorial to the wreck on the bottom of the lake commemorating that loss. This is the Bark Arabia. Um, unfortunately, we had no photographs of it uh, as it looked before it sank, but that's okay. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It's just a, a beautiful wooden sailing ship. Uh, I like to do some pictures in black and white because I think it helps show the texture and it helps show the lines. Obviously, this is in great shape. We got a bowsprit and jib boom. We have some anchors and we have some standing rig in here. These are called bob stay chains. Now, if you wonder what this looks like in color the day I dove it, we're just going to swim underneath that bowsprit to the port side. And that's what it looked like as I was there shooting it. Another cool fact uh, thing about this wreck is it has a mast which has fallen over and is lying on the port rail. 
and that mast has some really neat details to it. It's called a trestle tree, which is kind of what you think of as a crow's nest, I guess. This is where the lower mast and the upper mast were joined, where sailors, once they've scaled up the ratlins into the rigging, they could stand on this while they're doing um, maintenance chores or whatever up there. Uh, there's also rigging blocks uh, all around this wreck. And then in the distance, in the background of this photo on the bow is something called a uh, windlass. And that is a big drum that would rotate, which was used in lifting up the anchors and also any other heavy items that was sort of their winch. And then the anchors up on the front, which we're gonna take a real close at look here. These are huge heavy metal anchors and they have very large thick wood stocks. So they're called a wood stock anchor, uh, but they're a traditional anchor when you think, think of you know, an old anchor in that sense. And they're just, both of them stored right where they would have been when the vessel was under sail. And, uh, and that's just where they've stayed all, all these decades. Now, if we work our way towards the back or the stern of the vessel, about halfway back, about midships, we're gonna see something called a centerboard pocket. Now it's a sailing ship, so it has a keel. And uh, if you had a keel that never moved or couldn't be brought up, then you would not be able to get into shallow ports because your keel would hit the bottom of the lake. But this vessel and many others like it also had uh, something that was, it was called a swing keel or a swing centerboard and it was hinged so they could, they could crank it up. They could access those shallow ports to get more loads, get more business, get, you know, uh, more lumber on board or what, whatever they're carrying. And so this is the pocket that that centerboard would be winched up into. And also we're looking at a beautiful double sheaved rigging block here in the foreground. Um, just uh, really cool details that you don't see on every shipwreck in the Great Lakes. And then at the very back of the vessel, it's not as um, in, intact as the bow is. It's a little bit more broken up and part of it's fallen away to the starboard side. We're looking forward towards the bow here uh, at the very stern. And so the stern has fallen away and it's hit the bottom of Lake Huron. And here's the helm or the wheel. And then this is that stone memorial that we talked about that was placed at the 100th anniversary back in 1985. So that was the Arabia. We are going to get a little bit closer to home for you guys. We're going to head up to Isle Royale. Uh, you probably are familiar with that. It's a 40 mile long island. It's actually a national park and it belongs to the state of Michigan, oddly enough, not Minnesota or Canada. Uh, but it, it's great. Also, a lot of rock reefs and a lot of shipwrecks around there. And we're going to take a look at a vessel called the Henry Chisholm. She just left Duluth on her way to Buffalo uh, when she ran into a storm. She weathered the storm okay, but she had to cut loose her consort during the ordeal. And after the storm passed, Chisholm spent the next couple of days sort of motoring around looking for that 220-foot vessel that she'd been towing behind her uh, when the storm hit. While attempting to make harbor, she herself ran aground on a reef near Rock of Ages Lighthouse. And much of the vessel was salvaged before the remains were broke up by, you guessed it, yet another storm a week later. So there's a pattern developing here, storm, storm, storm. The double expansion steam engine that used to power this, uh, this propeller vehicle or, or vessel, at, it ended up hitting the bottom of the lake in 140 feet of water. And we're going to look at that. So it's relatively deep. She was carrying 92,000 bushels of barley at the time of her sinking. And not surprisingly, the Chisholm frequently set cargo capacity records during her 18 year career. So this is a side on shot of the stern, the very stern. This is the propeller, the rudder would have been behind it. Uh, rudder is since gone, but this prop, it looks a little funny. And, and here you can really see why, even though it's humongous as sort of uh, demonstrated by my dive buddy Scott in this photo, it's missing a blade. It's missing an entire, this was a four bladed prop. It's missing an entire blade here. And then it's also missing a chunk out of this blade here as well. So that's what happens when steel boats meet rock reefs. Reefs trump boats every time. <clears throat> this is that engine. This was a huge piece of cast iron equipment, uh, very intricate mechanical apparatus it was a, a double expansion steam engine. It created the power which drove the prop shaft, which turned the propeller, which made the boat go. It's three stories tall. It's 30 feet tall standing on the bottom of the lake. And if we swim up 
a little bit higher, we can see that it is it is all exposed. It's not like an engine in your car. You can see all the working parts to this thing, and it required a whole host of people to keep it functioning and oiled and everything else. And if we get in nice and tight and close, we can see the, the beautiful iron and the, the rusticles that are forming as it's been under the water for so long. But look at the detailing here. This is uh, interesting scroll work and detailing on the, on, on the side of this engine. And, and I guess the point is, is that there's nothing functional or mechanical uh, or structural about this. It's simply aesthetic. It's just there because it looks nice. This, this was built in a time and a place when the dollar wasn't necessarily always the bottom line. I mean, people, they took pride in what they built. And the other beautiful thing about this is that there's no quagga or zebra mussels. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they're the little tiny clam-like bivalves. They cover everything in <clears throat> the other four Great Lakes, but they haven't really inundated Superior yet. It's the last of the five lakes to succumb to these invasive species. They've been here since the 80s. They came in on, um, on, on foreign Eastern European vessels that were emptying their ballast tanks and, and they decided that they liked living in the Great Lakes and nothing eats them and they've proliferated over the years clearing up the water but they cover everything. So anyways, uh, that's why we could see all that beautiful ironwork. This is a four image mosaic of that same engine. You can see that how big it is. It is standing 30 feet off the bottom. Um, it's a four image mosaic. And what that means is I had to take four close up shots of the, of, of the steam engine and actually sort of stitch them or glue them together later after I got home from my trip in a, in a Photoshop program. And the reason why is the water just wasn't clear enough to allow me to get back far enough away to collect the whole image with one click of the shutter of my camera. I had to get up closer. I, I, I it would have just been sort of a dark, blob in the haze if I'd gotten that far away. So we're going to see more, more multi-image mosaics as the afternoon wears on. Okay, we're going to go up to the other end of Isle Royale. We're going to take a look at the Chester Congdon, which after 11 years on the lakes ran aground while fogged in at Canoe Rocks. She was carrying 380,000 bushels of wheat from Thunder Bay, Ontario. So this is, this is the biggest vessel we've seen so far today. It's, it's a huge modern day steel freighter. Um, and two days after grounding uh, on the reef, a storm come, came along and tore her in two. And she actually sank one, one part of her on one side of the reef, the other part on the other side of the reef. Before she sank, though, a lot of the ship's furnishings were salvaged while she was still sitting up on high and dry on the rocks. And this was also the first wreck in Lake Superior to be valued at over a million dollars. So this is kind of my little animation of what happened when the storm came along. She broke the bow off the rest of the vessel and they both slid down their respective halves of the reef and the bow sits on that steep angle looking up towards the surface wondering where the rest of its body went that's kind of how i feel like it like a snake with its head cut off uh, but when we look at the wreck underwater my camera is level uh, that's the angle that the bow is pointing up the rock reef it's sitting at the bottom of the reef at about 100 feet underwater and this is cool wreck too, because as a diver, if you're properly trained, you can penetrate these interior spaces in these rooms. There's really no artifacts left in there, but, um, but it's just fun to go in there. Also, this photo really demonstrates the raw power mother nature can come up with. And it can tear these giant steel vessels apart like children's paper toys. Uh, I mean, half inch thick plate steel is just crumpled like a beer can on the bottom of the lake. Uh, just a testament to the overwhelming power of mother nature. We're gonna leave Isle Royale. We're gonna go down to Michigan's Upper Peninsula to um, Munising, Michigan, where the, uh, the Bermuda was loading on iron ore reportedly with two feet of water in her bilge, which seems like a pretty poor decision to me. If you got water in the bilge, especially that much, you probably don't wanna take on a heavy load of iron ore, but hey, who am I to say? Uh, that was in Marquette, Michigan. And then pounding waves from a storm and the badly leaking hull forced her captain to seek shelter in Munising Bay, where in the middle of the night, she actually sank, sadly taking three of her crewmen with her. She sat there on the bottom in Munising Bay for 13 years until she was floated to be salvaged and towed to nearby Murray Bay, 
uh, by a salvage group. And it's there that her lifting chain slipped and the vessel once again settled on the bottom of Lake Superior, but this time now in only 25 feet of water. So she was in a protected bay, she was shallow, she was safe from the ravages of the, the bad storms and the ice that can hit the shoreline. And uh, she was only 10 years old when she sank the first time. As I said before, very shallow, very close to the surface. We can see my friend Reason doing some breath hold diving or free diving and uh, the, the water, the water uh, right there, be, you know, in the top of the frame. And of course, the deck is really close to the surface, so the sunlight easily penetrates it, and gets a nice coat of algae on it. <clears throat> this photo I love because it kind of reminds me of a pirate ship just sort of coming out of the mist, right, on a, on a, on a, on a like a stormy day. And the reason why the water is looking like this is because this vessel, this shipwreck, is it's visited by glass bottom tour boats all summer long out of Munising. They're just constantly running over this thing. And the day that we photographed it, we had to wait for one of these things to do its business. And it, it'll drift or float or the currents or the wind will push it. And then it has to re-jockey into position over it again. And so that the folks that paid for their tour can see through the bottom and see the decks of the vessel. Well, in the process of doing that, the, the prop wash from the tour boat will kick up all that sand and all that silt from the bottom of the lake. And it just turns the whole area into a big silty cloudy mess. And uh, by the time we anchored up after they left and, and got in the water and got diving, uh, this is what we had for visibility, which is cool. You know, it looks great. Also, again, still in Lake Superior, no zebras, no quagga mussels. Um, so we get to see the intricate detailing of the wood and how the vessel was actually assembled and put together. Even like this, this round hole here, it's called a hoss hole. And that's where the anchor chain would have gone up to the now missing windless, which would have been right up here in front of Steve. If you were to get inside the hull, like I did when I took the photo on the left, this is what it would look like. There's still piles of iron ore on the bottom. And we're looking up through one of the loading hatches. And then there are some missing deck boards here as well. Now the photo on the right is the cut water. That's the part of the boat, the leading edge of the bow. That's, that's the part that goes right through the water first. And I just thought it was an interesting photo because of the texturing on the wood and also the, the bowsprit here laying on the bottom of the, the lake. Last parting shot, I wanted to sort of get you a feel for how big this vessel is. The guy here with no, no tanks on holding his breath is my friend Reason. He's a really big man, okay? He's like 6'5", about 300 pounds. He's got giant man hands. Look at how small his hands look compared to the thickness of the rudder. That's about a six inch thick solid slab of wood, that rudder that turns that vessel. And the other cool thing about this photo, I like to call this the, the high tech, no tech photo, because uh, Steve here is wearing doubles tanks. And we usually only use those for really deep wrecks, um, not 25 foot shallow stuff. But that's what we had with us that weekend. That's what we were diving. So this is called technical gear. And so this is high tech and of course, no tech. <laughs> so we are going to come down into, I consider Lake Michigan my home lake. I lived in uh, New Berlin, Wisconsin, which is a Western suburb of Milwaukee on and off for most of my life. And um, I've dove so many times in Lake Michigan. I was fortunate to have Lake Michigan in my backyard as it were. And I could go diving twice a week in the summer there uh, out of Milwaukee. And so uh, I just love Michigan. It's just a, a great lake. And we're going to take a look at the Frank O'Connor, which was built in 1892. She was one of three sisters. And at 301 feet long, believe me, this vessel was pushing the limits of wooden boat building with an assist from hogging, which are iron straps that kind of held it all together. Um, they really never built wood freighters much bigger than the O'Connor. Uh, once, once they'd reached sort of this maximum uh, with the wood building, they went to steel. That's when steel boats were really starting to become popular. Anyways, the 26 year old vessel was carrying 3000 tons of coal from Buffalo to Milwaukee when she caught fire in the bow. Now the cause of the fire is actually still to this day unknown, but the ship, according to her records, had been carrying grain all season. And if any of you ever lived or worked on a farm, you know that grain dust is extremely flammable. 
And um, I, I suspect that there was plenty of dust in nooks and crannies and corners, which probably was the tinder that got the whole thing started. She was 10 miles offshore when the fire started and hoping to run her aground, the captain steered for shore. He got close, he got to within two miles before the steering gear burned through. And that's when the captain and crew abandoned ship and they took to their lifeboats. They began rolling away from the, the now just enraging uh, inferno. Um, and the Cana Island lighthouse keeper came out in his motorboat and he assisted the crew by towing their lifeboats away from the burning wreck, which reportedly could be seen burning well into the night. So now keep in mind that everything we're looking at here pretty much burned to, it just burned to the water line and everything below the water when it, it was sitting lower in the water, she's empty here in this photo, but uh, everything below the water line, of course, didn't burn because it was underwater, but it's now on the bottom. And it, it's really a shallow wreck, it's only 60 feet deep. Uh, and it was also, uh, we're gonna take another look at a steam engine. It was also powered by a, a expansion steam engine. This was a triple expansion steam engine, unlike the Chisholm, which was a double expansion. And it, and it had a giant 12 foot diameter prop, which the, it, the steam engine could turn it, I think up to 85 RPMs. So that's pretty impressive. That's a lot of power. Now you might be looking at this picture going, holy cow, why is the water so green? Well, uh, no, I didn't change it. That's what it really looked like the day we dove it. There was a huge algae bloom. And again, the water was pretty shallow. It's only 60 feet to the bottom here. So um, just made for like a, a great day diving in the, uh, the, I've dove in the Pacific Northwest off of uh, British Columbia, Canada, and they call that the Emerald Sea because the water is oftentimes that green up there too. So it was, it was cool to see it here. And, in Lake Michigan too. And this is a better shot at that 12 foot prop. We're looking straight at it from behind. And then this large flat object on the foreground is the rudder, which fell over at some point. A lot of debris on, on the bottom of, around this wreck as well. There's that triple expansion steam engine. Again, two and a half, three stories tall. Just a massive piece of equipment. And then to the left of it are the boilers. She had twin scotch boilers, which powered or actually produced the steam, which power, you know, the, the steam engine used to um, move the prop. Now, I said this was a 301 foot long vessel. So that's as long as a football field, right? That's a long way to swim underwater. But if you're so inclined and you swim from the stern up to the bow, you're rewarded with a very large pile of anchor chain and a really cool anchor, which my buddy Steve is uh, lighting up here. So it, it's worth it. And there's a few other things to see along the way. It's not like there's nothing in the middle. So that was the Frank O'Connor. <coughs> we're gonna slide a little bit closer down towards Milwaukee. We're actually off Two Rivers, Wisconsin here, a little north of Two Rivers. We're gonna take a look at the Rouse Simmons. Now the Rouse Simmons is in my, I always say this and I, I firmly believe it, it's the most famous shipwreck in Lake Michigan. And it was famous for bringing Christmas trees to Chicago every Yuletide season from Michigan's <laughs> upper peninsula. And Captain Scheunemann would sell those trees right off the deck of the ship to the public, down at the harbor, down at the dock, obviously cheaper than anyone else. He was cutting out the middleman, right? He was beloved. He was known as Captain Santa and, and the Christmas tree ship was um, a great Chicago tradition. And then in November of 1912, she just never showed up. And just to give you a frame of reference, 1912, that's the year the Titanic sank. Um, 23rd of November, the Rouse Simmons left, uh, left Thompson Harbor, Michigan with over 5,000 Christmas trees stuffed both in her holds and on the decks, which was also reportedly somewhat overloaded. She sailed straight into a winter storm. Now, prior to the sinking, two crew and the yawl boat were actually washed overboard by a large wave. The vessel tried valiantly to reach safe harbor as inferred by a message in a bottle, which was found after the ordeal although she wouldn't be seen again until 1971. She never made it. She sank during that storm uh, with all hands on board. She was found by Bayview, Wisconsin resident and shipwreck hunter Kent Bell Richard. Now, the Rouse Simmons was the one dive in my life that uh, I've never been able to replicate in terms of the visibility. Uh, the best visibility underwater meaning I could see the furthest of any dive I've ever done in any of the five Great Lakes at any point before or since. Just an absolute 
incredible day visibility. This is the whole vessel. It's a 124 foot long, three masted sailing ship. And we're looking at it. I'm about 80 feet above it at this point when I took this photo coming down the line. Now it was really dark down there. So I've lightened these photos up so we can see things a little better, uh, but the visibility is what it is. I can't fake that with, you know, computer tricks and stuff. It, it, either you have good visibility or you don't, and a camera captures it. Now, this vessel is so famous that uh, every wreck diver in the Great Lakes probably should dive it once or at least once, but it's not the best in terms of being the most intact of any schooner I've ever dove, but it, you know, the history, the provenance of it just makes it worth it. Here's up at the bow. This is the windlass and the anchor chain. If you ever make it over to Milwaukee or you're visiting Milwaukee and you're down by the lake shore, you can see one of the Ralph Simmons anchors on display in front of, uh, excuse me, Milwaukee Yacht Club. It's in their front lawn in front of their clubhouse. Another shot of the, the bow and some of the trees still in the holds uh, and the windlass. I love this shot. I'm, I'm probably 35 feet out in front of the wreck, maybe more. And the reason why I wanted to get out here and take this shot looking back at the vessel as it's coming towards us is because when she sank, she went down by the bow and she struck bow first and all the masts sort of snapped off and they all fell forward and they're laying on the lake bottom. And that's what we're looking at here is her masts. <clears throat> Again, look at the visibility. That diver is so tiny with his beam of light and his, his air bubbles in the back. It's just absolutely spectacular visibility. So this is my most famous photograph from that dive. It's been favorited tens of thousands of times on the internet and spread around. And um, you know, uh, it's just it's my favorite photo of that vessel. And this is where I come up with 140 feet of viz. I know that it's a 124 foot long ship and I know that I'm 15 out, feet out in front of it. So there's 140 feet right there. Um, and we can see, you know, we can see the back, just absolutely incredible. Also look at the bottom of the lake, look at these dark carpets. Those are the quagga mussels that we were talking about earlier and all the rough little bumpy stuff on the vessel. That's all the quagga mussels. Uh, they cover everything in Ontario, Erie, Huron and Michigan lakes. Um, just trillions of them, nothing eats them. And they just multiply and they filter feed the water. That's why the water's so clear here. Um, also some of the debris and damage, but these, these mats, these dark, these dark areas, that's the quaggas, the light stuff, that's the actual natural lake bottom. That's the sand and clay. So that was the Rouse Simmons, um, great dive. Now we're off of Milwaukee. I used to, I used to dive this wreck pretty regularly because it was right three and a half miles due east of Milwaukee's main harbor gap. Prince Wilhelm V was actually a modern day tragedy. She was a, a steel 258 foot freighter built in, in the Netherlands. And it used to just go back and forth between Europe and the Great Lakes region. Um, sank when it was, when it, when it collided with a, a barge full of bunker fuel oil that was being towed by a, tow, by, by a tugboat in 1954. So relatively recent, uh, she had functional radar uh, they just had it turned off. They just weren't using it. I mean, this was a whole different time 70 years ago. At any rate, um, she had functional radar, wasn't turned on, and the captain wasn't even standing on the bridge. They had just cleared Milwaukee's outer gap. They were leaving Milwaukee on their way back to Europe at the end of their trip. It was their uh, 25th trip of the region. She was only five years old. I mean, a relatively new vessel. And when she hit the barge, she went down in 90 minutes. She found herself in about 85 feet of water, but this wasn't the first time the vessel had sunk. She has actually sunk once before during construction by the retreating German army during World War II. This is crazy. This is Hollywood film script stuff, right? You can't make this up. The German army actually took this thing over when they invaded the Netherlands and it was still being built and they tried turning it into something that they could use, but then the allies liberated Europe and pushed Germany out. And as Germany was retreating, they dynamited it and it went to the bottom of Rotterdam Harbor. Anyways, when it sank here in Milwaukee, um, all 29 souls thankfully got safely, they, 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 were, they, got, they got off. Uh, they, they were saved by the Coast Guard cutter Hollyhock. Nobody died when it sank, but unfortunately, I believe it's claimed the lives of four divers since it's become a shipwreck. So we're going to take a look at another mosaic image. Took, 
three photos to get this, uh, three horizontal photos stacked on top of one another. It's coming straight at us. The camera is level. It's just that the, the vessel lies on its starboard or right side about 70 degrees over, almost all the way over on its right side. This was also my very first ever magazine cover. So I was uh, very proud of this. I have a huge blow up of, of this, this magazine cover framed and matted uh, hanging in my house. Anyways, Here's a better look uh, at that forward loading mast. There were two masts on this thing, uh, one at the front and one at the back. And that's how they got cargo in and out through the huge 20 foot square openings in the deck that's, that they would cap off when they were under sail. The other cool thing about this photo is there's a ridge in the lake bottom here about six feet tall off in the shadow on the right side by my cursor. And, and that's because as the water currents move around the vessel, they sort of carve out that sand and clay bottom of Lake Michigan. And they create this sort of like a, like a ledge or cliff almost all the way around the vessel, uh, oddly enough. Again, camera is level. This is the angle that she's leaning over on her right side. So the vessel's kind of coming at us, forward at us. We're looking towards the back of the vessel and Dirk is lighting up the pilot house windows. That's where the captain should have been standing when they hit that, that barge um, at about eight o'clock or 7.30 that October evening in 1954. Anyways, this is a smokestack coming up through the roof there. Now we're gonna swim around the pilot house underneath the smokestack over to just behind the smokestack, which is where we are right now. And you can see the back of that stack. This is the engine skylight it's uh, how they would get large machinery parts that had to be replaced or retrofitted in and out of the engine room, which is, of course, deep, deep, deep in the bowels of the ship. They would crane them up and out through this, this skylight. Now, the windows, the glass is all gone, and you can actually squeeze through this opening here. Uh, if you're not wearing double tanks like, like we usually do, uh, it's a little hard for it would be hard for Dirk to squeeze through there. But if he were wearing a single tank on his back and no tank on his side, he would be able to crawl through there. And one day I planned a photo shoot with my friend Brian. And this is deep inside the ship. This is the top of the engine. These are actually the five engine cylinders here. It was a five cylinder diesel engine. It was made by Stork Corporation of Germany, um, oddly enough. German engine in, a, in a, another one boat. Uh, but at any rate, uh, he's lighting up those, the tops of those cylinder heads. Now keep in mind, this thing's laying over on its right side. So you have to kind of tilt your head and pretend that you're standing on these catwalks on either side of it. And, uh, and, and you're looking down on the cylinder heads. Now, the other cool thing about crawling through shipwrecks is they're full of silt. And if you're not really careful, and even sometimes when you are, you, can, you end up kicking up a lot of this silt and it just turns into a giant cloud of junk and, and you can't see through it very well and you certainly can't photograph through it and while we crawled about two or three decks down to get to this point through that window that we were looking at earlier I kicked up a fair amount of this crap as I was crawling through this wreck and the whole cloud was behind me and it caught up to me about three seconds after I snapped this photo and so Brian and I then were quickly uh, encompassed in a giant cloud of silt and that was the end of the photo shoot but at least I got this photo we're in one of the cargo holds. We're looking out one of those 20 square foot openings out into the lake. And uh, underneath Brian here is a bunch of 55 gallon drums, which was part of the cargo that she was carrying when she went down. So this is maybe the single most, the single photo that I'm most proud of from my entire 20 year career photographing shipwrecks. It took 55 still photographs stitched together by hand in Photoshop to create this one, I call it impossible image of the entire 258 foot long freighter sitting on the bottom. No one else has ever done this. Um, it's the only photo in existence of its kind and it took a lot of work to make it happen, but it sure turned out good. We can see those loading masts kind of coming up from the deck of the ship towards us and the smokestack, here's that Here's that skylight window that we crawled through to get down into the engine room. The pilot house is over here and you can see the four uh, cargo loading bay openings in the deck. One, two, three, and four. And if you look really carefully, you can see a bunch of little shiny things. Those are some scuba tanks on the back of divers and there are little air bubbles going up towards the surface. Now this vessel is in about 85 feet of water, so it's not deep, but it's not shallow either. 
it's it's kind of the perfect it's kind of the perfect depth actually and we talked about the Ralph Simmons being the most famous shipwreck in Lake Michigan I think this is the most dived shipwreck in Lake Michigan maybe the Great Lakes period because of the fact that it's so close to Milwaukee Milwaukee's a huge diving city it's 80 feet deep it's it's really it's it's great for for novices and veterans alike you can spend over an hour on this because of the depth as a diver, it, you can penetrate all the different decks and all the different spaces. And, and I, I've probably dove this wreck 60 times in my life. I just never tired of it. The St. Albans uh, was a small wooden steamer which regularly ferried people and package goods back and forth between Wisconsin and Michigan, which is about an 80 mile trip across the lake. And she rammed a cake of pack ice while bound for Ludington, Michigan in January of 1881, shortly after leaving Milwaukee. So apparently it wasn't that bad a winter that they were still running boats across the lake in January. Uh, they turned around when they realized that they had a huge chunk of ice sticking out of the bow. They, they were closer to Milwaukee than Michigan, so they felt it was better to turn around and try and make port again in Milwaukee. They never made it. They ended up uh, foundering about 15 miles offshore. Now, there were 27 folks aboard, and they all survived the ordeal because they got in their lifeboats, and they rowed to shore. 15 miles, guys. That's a long row, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, unfortunately, a cow and her calf who were on board did perish in the sinking when they were unable to launch their own lifeboat due to having hooves and not thumbs. <laughs> Little dark humor there, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Great visibility on this dive. Um, it, it's deeper. It's about 160 feet deep. So uh, doesn't it, 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 it's usually got better viz because it's deeper. And it's, it's a little broke up. The bow is sort of leaning off to the starboard side. The vessel is coming straight at us in this photo. And Steve is coming up along the port or left side. We can see the windlass here on the, on the, the deck. And it kind of separated from the rest of the vessel. The rest of the vessel fades back into the, into the mist of the, of the visibility here. But um, this may be really hard to see, but right at the tip of my cursor is a tiny, tiny little white dot. And that is my buddy Steve's camera. And the reason why it's sitting on the deck is because when we both came down the line, and he's a really good underwater photographer too. Uh, when, when we both came down the line, I turned mine on and he went to turn his on and he realized he never changed the battery. So his battery was dead and the camera was now a giant brick that he wasn't going to tote around for the whole dive. So he just left it on the deck and that made him my dedicated dive model for the for the dive which we never we never did see better biz than this ever on on this wreck so i think he's pretty pissed that he didn't get a chance to take photos on this great visibility day but one of the things you should take away from this photo is the amount of flotsam and debris uh, scattered along the lake bottom from the sinking just a violent sinking for whatever reason and there is just parts of this ship all over the place we're at the app absolute back end of the complete opposite end of the vessel now we're looking at the stern and we're looking forward and now you can really see that white dot in the photograph on the deck that's his dome port reflecting light where he set it and he picked it up at the end of the dive and took it back to the boat with him obviously he's about ready to swim over the top of the smokestack right here or at least part of it this is on the on the fan tail the very stern here on the deck is a capstan that was like a giant winch that they would use for hauling and mooring lines docking lines even raising the stern anchor things of that nature we can see part of the steam engine very similar type apparatus to what we saw in the chisholm and the uh the o'connor frank o'connor and then part of the engine there as well lots of debris all over the place here's bow on the left, stern on the right. Photograph on the right shows Steve shining his light on the propeller and behind the propeller, you can see the rudder. Just a great shipwreck, lots of fun. You can see the deck here that has collapsed between the very forward portion of the bow and the midships sort of pulled away. All right, last one for the, for the day guys. Then we, then we can come up and get some air. So this is the Car Ferry, Milwaukee. It's off of Fox Point, which is a suburb north of Milwaukee, about seven miles north of Milwaukee. Um, when I say car ferry, I don't mean automobiles. I mean train cars, railroad cars, okay? So it was lost on October 22nd, 1929. And if 
those of you who know your history, you're going to realize that that is exactly one week before the financial tempest that, of course, ushered the nation into the Great Depression, what we called Black Friday. And this, of course, was a storm of a different kind that sent the car ferry Milwaukee to the bottom of the lake. She was attempting to make Grand Haven, Michigan. She had left Milwaukee in a storm. She had just come across from Michigan that morning, came to Milwaukee, did what she had to do, reload, fuel, whatever. And part of her crew actually left the boat, went in to see a movie show in downtown Milwaukee. And when they heard the ship's horn blasting, they couldn't believe that the captain was going to go back out into that tempest that was raging. None of the other boats were leaving Milwaukee. The car ferry Milwaukee was the only one that left. At any rate, she was last seen by the Harbor's Lighthouse ship as she was pitching and rolling badly in heavy seas soon after leaving the harbor. And like so many other unfortunate tales, they too turned around and they tried to make it back to port, but they foundered, never making it, presumably from what uh, we now know as a bad, badly bent seagate. And we're, we're gonna talk about what the seagate is. And, and it helped to flood the lower portions of the vessel. So the seagate is in the up position right now, but it's, a, it's about a three foot high steel door that would swing down and close over the back deck here. And I think the waves were just so bad that it just crunched it in until the water was no longer able to be kept out of the vessel. And it, there's big grates in the floor here underneath the railroad cars and the water would just go down through those grates into the lower levels until finally sh she sank. Uh, all hands were lost, about estimated at 46 souls aboard. A lifeboat did show up on the other side of Lake Michigan in Michigan with several would-be survivors' bodies in it. They were frozen stiff. They were frozen uh, solid. And that lifeboat, actually, if you ever make it to Milwaukee, can be seen if you go to, uh, I'm sorry, not Milwaukee, in Port Washington, Wisconsin, about a half-hour drive north of Milwaukee. That lighthouse has the lifeboat usually on the uh, front lawn. So let's take a look at, this was a huge 330-foot-long steel hulled vessel and it's coming straight at us in this in this photo as it's sitting upright on the bottom dirk and mike are swimming across the front of it here's her steel equipment mast now we're at the far back end of the the vessel we're looking at the stern we're looking forward it's sailing away from us and there's actually two propellers you can't really see them in this photo because they're kind of in shadow but there's a port and a starboard side propeller and then here's that that badly bent seagate, which is still mangled and hanging there. And then also these things up here, that's the railroad rails that the cars would roll onto the deck of the ship. This ship could carry about 30 uh, train cars. So, and the reason why they would roll train cars onto a ship, if you're wondering why would they do that? It's because if you had to get uh, your, your, your product through Chicago. Chicago was even in the 1800s and early 1900s, it was just a quagmire. I mean, the, the, the rail yards down there were, were just completely overloaded. And there was so much going through there, it would take sometimes weeks to get cars through there. So if you absolutely had to have it overnight, you had to get it through, put it on a, pay a little extra money, put it on a boat, sail it across the lake. There were a lot of boats like the car ferry Milwaukee that did that. There's the starboard prop and prop shaft. And again, huge prop. I think that's a 12 foot diameter prop as well. Brian's lighting this thing up. Now the really cool thing that I always tried to visit when I was um, diving this wreck was the stern. Look at this rail car truck. This is a wheel set. This is one of the, one of the wheel sets off a train car. So when one of those cars came off the back of that vessel in the storm, um, the box cars are not permanently attached to the wheels. So the box car would have floated, the wheels would have sunk immediately like a paperweight, like a stone right to the bottom of Lake Michigan. And uh, we can see it sort of half buried underneath the sand here in the clay. But the, the ship just, it, you know, what are, the, what are the odds, right? It's just coincidence that the ship settled right on top of that railroad truck, just really wild. Here it is again, coming straight at us. This is the bow and Brian is lighting up the starboard hoss hole. So again, very tall ship, very big ship, 300 some feet long, probably 30 feet high here off the lake bottom, uh, pretty massive. Now off here to the right, about 80 feet off the ship's port bow actually is the pilot house, which is what we're looking at here. So this was again, the, going back to talking about wooden structures and built up air pressure and how things would blow off. So the, the entire pilot house and the 
chart house, which was a huge room behind it, as a, as a solid wooden structure, all came off the vessel in a single piece, probably floated for a while and then eventually sank. Well, it ended up sinking just 80 feet away from the rest of the vessel off the port bow. In this photograph, if the visibility were really good and if it was a little lighter out, because this was almost nighttime when we were diving this, you'd be able to see the vessel in the background behind it here. But Cameron is lighting up with his light. And then we also had some off camera lighting that we put inside the pilot house for the photograph. This was a planned photo shoot. And this was some of the creative stuff that we started doing there um, in the later years. So that's, uh, that's just a taste of my shipwreck photography. And I'm also a professional artist as well as a photographer. And I've done a lot of archeological renderings of shipwrecks on the bottom for book covers for museums and things of that nature so there's a lot of that cool stuff at my website so if if you're interested please go to calsworld.net and there you can see all of my incredible shipwreck photography from all five of the great lakes um i've, I've dove ontario erie here on uh, over 100 shipwrecks around north america most of them in the great lakes and these are just a list of, of the ones that, uh, that I've been on over the years. So if you're interested to see more of that, that would be great. Now I'm gonna back out of this and I am going to go back into regular mode and stop screen sharing. And then we can have a question and answer period. So that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you, Cal. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions about underwater photography or the Great Lakes in general or scuba diving or shipwrecks or anything like that? What training did you get for underwater photography? <laughs> um, I was actually a professional photographer on land and then I became a diver. So I just started shooting underwater. But I mean, I've read a lot of books about it because it's not an apples to apples comparison. There's a lot of different things that you need to know about underwater stuff. But I at least had that jump start. Owned the ships? Were they uh, personally owned by rich magnets, or are they uh, country, other countries? Not. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the the vast majority of those vessels were all owned by shipping companies. Uh, some of the schooners, like the Ralph Simmons, was owned by uh, a, a, comp, a lumber company. And it was originally used to haul a lot of lumber, you know, for building houses and things of that nature. And then they would just sort of at the end of the year, they'd try and make some extra money carrying Christmas trees. Uh, but even the, even the Ralph Simmons was owned by Hackley and Sons out of Michigan, I believe. So a company and of course the bigger ships, yeah, they were all owned by transportation companies and things of that nature. Um, most of the vessels we looked at were just too big to be privately owned. Were they insured so they were uh, reimbursed for their losses? Oftentimes the vessels were insured for a portion of their value. Um, but I think anytime a, a vessel sank, the owners took a hit, regardless of whether it was insured or not. Yeah, it was just a question of how much were they going to lose. But obviously, as we talked about in the beginning part of this show, there's 6,000 or more shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. That's an inordinately high amount of shipwrecks that's a lot of and, and those are the ships think about how many people you know that the region the, the, this part of the country has lost due to uh, those people perishing when their vessels went down just um, tens of thousands of maritime sailors who were trying to feed their families any way they could, just trying to earn a living, just trying to get by. I mean, this, this was not a glorious industry to be involved in. You know, this, these, these were the truckers of the day, I guess. Were any of the captains or anything of those ships ever brought up on charges for uh, the things that they did? Like the one that had, didn't put on the, there was his radar and wasn't on, um, on the deck at the time? That is a yeah, that's a great question. I was just going to say that the Prince Willem actually was investigated. It was a modern tragedy. The Coast Guard did a, an investigation, and in that they found that the um, both parties actually were at fault. Um, the vessel was, I think, the vessel was insured by Lloyd's of London for. I want to say one, 
$1.25 million at the time in 1954. And the cargo was insured, it was estimated at another three quarters. So it was about a $2 million loss. Um, and they paid off a certain amount to the Orange Line, which was the, 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 the federal shipping company owned by the the nation of the Netherlands. They owned, uh, they owned the shipping line. It was called the Orange Line. And that's who owned the Prince Willem. I don't know that there was any actual penalties paid by the captain or by, and, and the tugboat was blamed too, because they said that the tugboat that was towing the barge that struck the Prince Willem, that there was no lights on the barge and it was nighttime so that they were supposed to have lights on it. They said they had lights the people on the Prince Willem that struck the barge said, no, we didn't see any lights. So, you know, he said, he said, right. So the, yeah, I mean, there was a big hearing and, and there was some blame uh, sort of doled out, but I don't think anybody went to jail. Um, does anybody have questions about like the differences between Lake Superior and the other lakes with those quagga mussels? So you could see on a lot of those shipwrecks, those, those bumpy bivalves that are just, there are billions and trillions of them down there. And, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, that's what's cleaning up the water in, in the Great Lakes. And it's making photographers like me able to get these huge, great panoramic shots because the water sometimes can be 80, 90 feet of visibility clear. Whereas Lake Superior, it's not that clear. It's 30 or 35 feet because there's no muscles there clearing it up. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. But I, I have a lot of friends who were diving many years before I started back in the 70s, before these muscles came into the lakes, before they got clear. And they said that if you could see your hand stretched out in front of your face on a dive, that was good visibility. They oftentimes bumped into the wreck before they saw it. Are there any salvage groups that go in there and try to bring up some of this, some of these ships and whatnot? Good question. No, there aren't. And the reason why is because there, it's not legal to do that any longer. I believe in 1987 or 88, there was a law passed called the Abandoned Ships Wreck, Shipwrecks Act. And basically it said that everything on the bottom of the Great Lakes belongs to whomever state those waters uh, lie in. So there's a giant imaginary line going down Lake Michigan separating uh, the state of Michigan's bottomlands and the state of Wisconsin's bottomlands. And everything on the bottom belongs to those states. And that's true for all parts of the Great Lakes. So it's illegal to take anything. It's illegal to remove anything from a shipwreck um, or, or anything off the bottom, theoretically. Um, and so this was not always the case. As I said, the law didn't happen until 1987 or 88. Before that, you could take stuff. And a lot of divers would go down and they'd take toilets and sinks and portholes and wheels and you know, all kinds of stuff, whatever they could strip off of a wreck, that was kind of their pastime. And it took a lot, of, a lot of years to train divers from the take mentality to the preservation mentality. But now um, if you get caught taking something off a shipwreck by uh, an authority such as the Coast Guard or, or the police or the Customs Border Patrol or, or anything like that, it's as serious as poaching deer at night with shining light, you know, shining deer at night and, and shooting them out of season. I mean, you will lose everything. You will lose your boat, your, your gear. You will spend thousands of dollars in fines and go to jail. It's a huge, huge serious thing. So that's why they, they don't get salvaged anymore. What ever happened to, did they ever find out what happened to the Edmunds Fitzgerald? Was that, did that sink in, in Lake Superior? Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. So the Edmund Fitzgerald, probably the most famous shipwreck in the Great Lakes uh, because of Gordon Lightfoot's song that came out back in the seventies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it sank on November 10th, 1975 with all, all 29 souls aboard lost in 530 feet of water. They found it uh, and some years afterward, after finding it, they removed the original bell. It's actually a big bell and they, the bell is now in a museum. You can see it. It's all shined up. It's got the names of all the people that died inscribed on it. And it's sitting in a museum in Paradise, Michigan on the shores of Lake, uh, Lake Superior. And they replaced it with a, a, 
I guess, a, a replacement bell. They welded one on. It's also a graveyard. Um, you're not allowed to, or a gravesite. You're not allowed to visit it. You're not allowed to dive it. There's been documentaries made about it. They've visited it with submarines and things of that nature. And we know everything we need to know about it for the most part. So nobody's allowed to go back. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That one's pretty tough to dive anyway, isn't it? Because of how- it, Yeah, oh yeah, 530 feet. I, I'm good to 200 feet. That's the 202 feet the deepest I've ever been. And um, the older I get, you know, uh, diving deep like that is really hard physiologically on, on a diver's body. There's a lot of things that happen when you're at pressure um, like that. You're at multiple atmospheres of pressure and you have to really take your time coming up or you can get the bends. And it's, it, you know, the longer in tooth we get as a diver, the, 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 the less good that is for us phys physically. So I will never probably dive to 200 feet again either. But um, uh, down here in South Carolina, I don't know how much diving I'm going to get in the Great Lakes. It's a long, it's a long commute. <laughs> <laughs> Did that happen in a storm also? That it went down in a storm? Yeah, that the Edmund Fitzgerald, yes, it went down in a, in a pretty bad storm. Yes. Yeah, they, they suspect that they had 30 foot waves crash, oh. you know, waves, green water coming over the decks of that vessel. So, yeah. Is there a time period in history that was the worst for shipwrecks on the Great Lakes or not? That's an interesting question. I don't believe anybody's ever asked that. Um, I think, you know, it probably goes like this uh, or actually probably like this. As the decades go by, there's fewer and fewer and fewer shipwrecks because, of course, safety measures, and we learn from our mistakes sometimes, not all the time. Um, you know, so in the 1800s, yes, uh, and it all started with LaSalle's wreck in 1679, of course, of the of the Griffin, which is considered the Holy Grail of, of Great Lakes shipwrecks, um, still not found. But um, once we get into the mid 1900s, you know, the mid 20th century, we've still lost a few big freighters like the Fitzgerald in 75, I think was probably the last big one. Carl Bradley went down. There's a couple other big freighters uh, that went down. There's four big freighters in Great Lakes, similar to the, besides the Fitzgerald or in addition to. So <clears throat> we get fewer and fewer of these things, but I believe there was something, excuse me, guys, <clears throat> I got a frog in my throat. Something off of Port Washington, a small fish tug that went missing called the Linda E back in the 80s. And it was roll, steamrolled right over by one of these freighters in, in dense fog. And those, those guys never made it home. I think that was sort of the last high profile sinking. Of course, there's always private watercraft that sink here and there in the port, ports or around the breakwaters. You know, guys get drunk and they drive their boats up on the rocks. That still happens to this day. But for the most part, the big shipwrecks are, are um, just about over with, I think, hopefully, let's hope so. Have you done any diving off South Carolina? Off of where? Off South Carolina, where you are now? Um, I did a trip, oddly enough, 12 years ago, down to North Carolina with my buddies from Milwaukee. Took mm -hmm. us 25 hours to get there, driving straight through with two trucks loaded full of our gear from Milwaukee. And uh, we spent a week diving out of Hatteras, North Carolina in what's called the Outer Banks area or uh, Diamond Shoals, which is kind of the graveyard of the Atlantic. A lot of World War II wrecks out there. Um, I've not dove anything off of South Carolina yet. I've only been here for about seven or eight months. And actually all of my dive gear is still in a, a storage locker in, Mil in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So um, I haven't had a place to bring it to yet. My wife and I built a house down here in and um, I'm coming to you live from my fifth wheel camper. So um, that's where we've been living for seven months while our house got built. Have you ever dived in the Mississippi? I've not dove in the Mississippi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the high current bothers me. Uh, that's a pretty swift moving river. I've dove um, in a place called Bon Terre, which is just outside of St. Louis, a little south of St. Louis. And that is the world's largest man-made underground cavern system. It was actually a lead mine for a hundred years and they shut it down in the, in the mid eighties. And then when they turned the pumps off, it filled back up with water. And some of the lower, most of the lower levels are flooded and they turned it into a sort of a diver destination. So I've been there a few times. Uh, I've dove 
a lot of inland lakes around Wisconsin. Black River Falls is the closest I've gotten to you guys. There's a uh, Lake Wazi is a great training spot. That's where I've done some some deep deep water training because it's controlled environment, right? It's not the Great Lakes. It's you don't you you don't have to worry about storms. You can walk in off the shore. You don't have to rent a boat or any of that stuff. So that's a, why there's a great amount of divers that go to Wazi for training, and you can get deep because it's an old open pit uh, mine there as well. So. Uh, the Caribbean, Cozumel, Bahamas, St. Croix, uh, San Diego, Point Loma, LA, Channel Islands, British Columbia, Hatteras, and then of course all five of the Great Lakes. Yeah, I've been around. Did you know Jacques Cristo? <laughs> I would I would Did you ask if I knew Jacques? Yeah. yeah. I wish, man, I wish I, I do. Oh, um, yeah. I was, I was just a kid, you know, watching that stuff, oh, uh, mutual oh. of Omaha and Jack Stowe's undersea world, that stuff oh, yeah. on television. Love that stuff. Uh, would have given anything to meet him. The most famous guy, <clears throat> guys I ever met, I had a barbecue lunch and a private audience with John Chatterton once who uh, is probably one of the most famous divers still diving alive. Um, he's on TV. He's had a lot of TV shows. I've met uh, his partner, Richie Kohler. Also met Stan Waterman, who's now in his 90s. I believe Stan's about 92 or 93. But Stan Waterman was probably the most prolific and most famous underwater cameraman uh, out of the United States back in the 60s and 70s. He had an eye patch. And um, I got a chance to meet him at a dive symposium once back in Chicago years ago. So I uh, had a chance to rub some elbows with some, some pretty cool folks in the industry. And um, yeah, it's, it's been great, but not Jacques, unfortunately. Not Jacques, okay. <laughs> How did you get interested in starting to dive? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think I was about six or seven years old. And every summer I'd spend a month with my grandparents in Hayward. They lived on Nelson Lake, just, out, just outside of Hayward, Wisconsin. And I mean, I'd walk out on my grandpa's pier and, you know, I'd walk, I, I'd look down through that orange rust tannin stained water you could see down about two and a half three feet in nelson lake until you could see the ripples in the sand disappear until you just couldn't see anymore i always wonder what is on the bottom where i can't see the bottom you know what am i missing out on and so that's where it started um and then i think i was 16 and i started taking diving lessons and i i didn't finish i made it through the class in the pool room but then it was in winter and then when they called me in spring to come out to some quarry you know ice water and i and i was pretty freaked out by that and I just never went and got my open water which was the third and final portion of the the certification so it took 16 years after that I was 32 when I finally certified um, and it was a treat to myself for quitting smoking and so I, I did get certified in 1999 and I've been diving ever since <clears throat> Well, you guys have been a phenomenal audience and really thank you for coming out in that heat today. Stay safe, stay hydrated and um, hope, hope all those bad storms are done in your area. And thank you for such wonderful questions and being just such an awesome audience. I really appreciate it. I bet Janelle has lunch ready for us, so we will sign off. Thank you so much, Cal. Have a great day yourself. Caroline, thank you so much. Be well, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Very interesting.